Hi there, my name's Donna Gans. I'm the National Lymphoma Nurse Manager with Lymphoma Australia and I'm coming to you from ASH 2019 in Orlando, Florida and I'm joined this morning by um, Associate Professor Chan Chia who um, comes to us from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital and Hollywood Private Hospitals in Perth, Western Australia. Good morning, Chan. Good morning, Donna. Um, this morning you um, happened to share a session with aggressive lymphomas and looking at optimising frontline therapies. Um, could you give us a bit of a rundown on some of the key abstracts and presentations this morning? Of course. So of the, there were six abstracts presented, but I'll highlight three of them. The first abstract was presented by uh, Daniel Persky, and this, this was basically looking at uh, a group of patients with limited stage diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The trial was called um, S1001 and it enrolled patients with stage 1 or stage 2 diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with uh, non-bulky disease and the trial design was exploring uh, three cycles of RCHOP followed by an interim PET scan and that guided further therapy. Patients with a negative PET had one further cycle of RCHOP for a total of four. Patients with a positive interim PET scan went on to receive radiation at a reasonably high dose of at a reasonably high dose followed by a, a radio immunotherapy based consolidation which is a slightly unusual design the the, the, the top line results of the study are that um, essentially most patients had a negative PET scan, the vast majority of patients in fact, as you would expect for a fav favourable risk group of patients. And for those patients, their outcomes were excellent, even with a, uh, a five-year uh, progression-free survival approaching 90%. For the group of patients with a positive PET scan, uh, they uh, actually didn't do quite so well, but uh, with the addition of radiotherapy and uh, radio immunotherapy at that point, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the outcomes were brought up to a level that was, you know, close to approaching, but not quite as favourable as the IPET negative patients. I think it's difficult to interpret the um, the uh, the escalation arm with the IPET positive patients because I think most of us don't feel that the radio immunotherapy is actually needed. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in a subsequent session, Laurie Sen presented data from the BC Cancer Database showing that uh, using a PET directed approach, the vast majority of patients are adequately treated with four cycles of RCHOP and radiation if they're PET positive. So I don't really think that that radio immunotherapy is, is needed, mm -hmm. nor is it reimbursed in most jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. But probably the most important point coming from that is that uh, it reinforces what a lot of us have thought after the, the German flyer study and the French study in that patients with limited stage diffuse large B-cell lymphoma do not require six cycles of chemotherapy for the most part, mm -hmm. and four cycles of chemoimmunotherapy is sufficient if the PET scan after three cycles is negative. Okay. And what do you find um, most clinicians currently do for four cycles? Or I, th I think there's a lot of variation in practice because yeah. um, the, the, the difficulty with interpreting, uh, interpreting the previous trials has been a mismatch in the inclusion criteria. and. There, so there's been a bit of uncertainty about, um, you know, if I've got a patient with a stage bona fide IPI, which is um, more than uh, one or greater, can I still apply these data? And, and I think that, you know, about 23% 23, 23 of patients with uh, uh, in, in the S1001 study actually were high risk. And so I think that that's really conclusively answered that. Yep. And I feel pretty comfortable now treating most limited stage patients with four cycles of RCHOP if they're IPET3 negative. Um, and I don't think radiation is required for those group of patients. And that's really good. It's less toxicities for Absolutely. patients as well. And Absolutely. I think that's really important now that we're knowing that yeah. works quite well for those patients. What other um, uh, presentations did you find was interesting? So the, the other abstract which I would highlight from that session was the, the, the French data. So they performed a trial called the Senior Study, which was the first randomised trial of uh, patients with diffuse treatment-naive diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in a very elderly uh, population. Uh, you will recall that uh, Judith Trotman and um, Emma Werner led an Australian trial in a similar space called IRIC, which explored r mini plus abrutinib. It was a phase two trial. Um, this was a uh, randomised phase three trial with uh, quite a large number of patients for a relatively rare uh, uh, population. And the question that they were asking was whether the addition of lenalidomide at a do dose of 10 milligrams for 10 days per uh, mini chop cycle um, improved overall survival. And I think a few, few good things about the study. One, it's an area of high unmet need because we know that 
uh, elderly patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma don't do as well as their younger counterparts. Number two, it was a um, the, the primary endpoint was overall survival, which I think is really critical for this population and not a surrogate endpoint at all. And number three, I think that the uh, there has been previously signals uh, about the potential utility of lenalidomide in this group of patients, and they did exploratory analysis uh, of the impact on uh, the, the patient group overall and also split along the lines of uh, cell of origin. So the headline results of this trial is that it was negative overall, um, which is clearly a, a, a disappointment. Mm -hmm. And I think the, you, you might speculate about why it was negative. Certainly the toxicity was increased. Um, there was more thrombosis, so there were, there were more pulmonary embolisms and, and DVT in, in that group of patients with lenalidomide. And probably not surprising given that age, steroid use and cancer are all risk factors for thrombosis. Yeah. Um, there was, uh, the, the, the lead author did mention that um, a number of the patients who did have uh, DBT were not actually on adequate um, anticoagulation despite that being in the protocol. So mm. I, I, aspirin may, may not be enough in this group of patients yep. when high dose steroids are being used in addition to everything else. So patients who received low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis didn't seem to get issues with DBT. But so, I mean, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't advance the field, but I think it was a great trial. Mm. It was an important question. And, uh, you know, I, you, you might speculate that maybe the dose of lenalidomide wasn't high enough, but, but on the same, by the same token, I suspect that it was a carefully designed dose because the amount of toxicity that you would see would, in that population, more myelosuppression, more, more, more neutropenic sepsis, probably would not have been deliverable at a higher dose. So I think that's um, probably drawn a line through that particular strategy. Yeah. Um, the, I know that the UK cooperative group are now exploring um, uh, polituzumab in a, a randomised trial of polituzumab in that same po that patient population, mm -hmm. and, I, and we're hoping that that may be in advance. Yeah. No, it's good. Then this is the reason why we try all these different medications to see what the toxicity profile and yeah. see how they go with patients yeah. as well. So that's fantastic. And from the third abstract that was found interesting? Yes. Yeah, so the third abstract of interest from that session was a, a trial called the Marietta trial. And this was a phase two single arm trial using um, intensive chemoimmunotherapy with a, a regimen called Matrix, which is methotrexate, high dose cytarabine, thiotipa and rituximab, alternating with um, ICE, which is a commonly used platinum-based um, second-line chemotherapy regimen, uh, iphosphamide, carboplatin and toposide with rituximab for patients with uh, secondary CNS lymphoma. So this is a really, this was a really important trial because it was, it was difficult to do. These patients are uncommon. So as we've seen in other data sets, only about three to 4% of patients with large B cell lymphoma develop secondary CNS recurrence. And what that means is uh, this is a, a patient who initially had a lymphoma in the lymph nodes, but it came back and when it came back, it, it involved the brain or the, or, the spinal, or the spinal cord or the spinal fluid. So it's, it's a rare event, but it, it's, it's um, particularly challenging for patients and their carers because unfortunately the prognosis of patients who have that occurrence is actually uh, fairly short. It's a very difficult to treat situation. Mm -hmm. And so to do a even a phase two trial in this population is challenging and uh, it was important work. So the, in this study, uh, patients who had central nervous system um, recurrence of their lymphoma with or without systemic lymphoma received a, a small amount of RCHOP as debulking therapy if they had nodal disease, followed by um, alternating uh, cy uh, two cycles of matrix, followed, followed by uh, R-ICE. And the uh, primary endpoint was the uh, one-year progression-free survival rate from memory. Probably the, the key takeaway from this is that although uh, you know, uh, around about 40% of patients had durable uh, disease control and the overall response rate was in about 44% or something like that, mm -hmm. which although it sounds a bit disappointing, in, in this patient population um, using standard chemotherapy approaches, um, the, the, the median survival of these patients is actually fairly limited. So I think incorporating this, the um, more intensive matrix um, uh, regimen in, a, in addition to rice, provides chemotherapy to cover not only the central nervous system um, by including 
uh, types of medicines which actually can cross into the brain, yep. but also giving systemic chemotherapy that can treat the lymphoma that's left in the body. So yeah. I, I think it's, it was a reasonable thing to, to try. Yes. I think the overall results are still probably a little bit disappointing and, and we need to do more work there. Yeah. And I think that that's an area where the introduction of novel drugs, maybe BTK inhibitors, yeah. maybe PD-1 inhibitors, um, may could be the way forward there. Yeah. And as you touched on, it, it is a very difficult um, yeah. group of people to be able to treat. So yeah. that's very promising anyway.